Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Whitaker, Empowerment Strategist, Trauma Specialist, and Shadow Guide. And I'm here today to share with you a model called the SCARF model. And you heard that right, SCARF, as if you're wearing a scarf around your neck in the winter to stay warm, same word. Um, only the SCARF model was designed by um, a man named David Rock. And David Rock developed the SCARF model to help us all better understand the environmental factors that our brains are monitoring all the time beneath our conscious awareness, which means it's happening automatically and we're not, we're not even aware that it's happening, but our brains are monitoring the environment for threats on a regular and ongoing basis. So I didn't know if you knew that, but it's impor important to be aware of because it's part of our physiology and it can help us understand those things that we call triggers and triggers impact our motivation. And we most often associate triggers with things that put us into a threat state, threats, things that upset us or offend us. However, triggers can also put us into a reward state. And the SCARF model can help us look at five different factors in the environment that depending on how we handle them can either move us toward threat or reward in the brain. So let's go ahead and talk about the SCARF model. The first aspect of the SCARF model, the S stands for status. And status is our sense of personal worth and it's our perception of where we are in relation to the people around us. A decrease in status moves the brain into a threat response. And under a threat response, the same areas of the brain activate as if you were experiencing physical pain. So you heard that right. If you actually had a physical injury, the areas of the brain that light up are the same areas that light up when you're triggered and experiencing a threat response as a result of the trigger. So things that can cause this type of threat response under the status area are things like critical feedback or negative feedback or unsolicited advice. And they're perceived by the subconscious mind as a threat to your life. Some other threats could be a demotion, financial loss, a divorce, your team loses, um, being embarrassed or humiliated in front of people. These all put us into a status threat response. However, an increase in status generates a reward response in the brain. And let's say that you were under the scanner and received a monetary reward. Well, the same areas of your brain light up as if you received a monetary reward whenever your status moves into a reward response, only it lights up and activates more intensely than if you had actually received a monetary reward, which is kind of interesting to me. So um, some other rewards, examples, um, could be a promotion, a financial reward, um, possessions. Uh, people like stuff. It's just how it is. Your team might score or win. Public recognition um, and having some sort of positive feedback in public rather than being humiliated or embarrassed in front of others, but being recognized publicly can send us toward that reward response. And if you're a boss and you have employees or you're a parent or a teacher working with kiddos, um, you can ask them, instead of giving them feedback, ask them to give feedback on their own performance. Um, how would you rate yourself? Or if you're a parent, what would you do if you were faced with somebody who behaved the way you just did? And that can send them a little bit more toward a reward response rather than that loss of status and that threat response. So the C in SCARF stands for certainty. And certainty is a sense of what the future holds. Ambiguity generates a threat response. The brain is a certainty creating machine and it's always trying to predict the future. It's always trying to make up stories about what will happen next. And sometimes in order to create those stories about what will happen next, it comes up with a false narrative. And so those are threat responses and those are like controlling mechanisms, like those stories and false narratives are ways that we manage the uncomfortable feeling of being in the uncertain. 
and clear expectations can provide far more certainty. And parents, teachers, and managers tend to forget this sometimes. So clear guidelines can move people toward the reward circuits in the brain, whereas a lack of transparency, dishonesty, and unpredictability all move the brain toward threat. It's best to set transparent expectations, clear goals, and have realistic schedules and deadlines. Uncertainty has been the cause of the collective threat responses we've all been experiencing in recent years because the pandemic put us into a huge uncertain ambiguous, ambiguous unknown. And so collectively, we've all been under threat. Um, but in order to push us more toward reward, assurance and affirmation can really help in this area. Expected results and um, achievements can help. Things that can put us under threat are bad news, um, failures at work or at school, um, somebody that we know, like a hero, um, falls or fails, um, economic downturns. And I do want to circle back and say with failure, there is an opportunity to turn that failure into a future reward if you can condition your mindset into looking at failures as opportunities to learn and to grow and to try again differently next time. So if it goes better next time, then you can move yourself toward the reward. All right, let's look at A. The A in SCARF stands for autonomy. And autonomy is a sense of having control over our own lives. So when a person has no control, no choice, no autonomy, the stress and threat level that that person experiences is dramatically higher. Conversely, during a stressful situation, if a person has a sense of control or some level of choice in the matter, even if it's a stressful situation, the stress levels drop dramatically just by having a sense of choice. Providing choices, delegating duties, as in putting your trust in another person to handle some aspect of a job, Self-responsibility and empowerment are all ways to build autonomy and move toward that reward response, while things like micromanagement and constant authoritative leadership or parenting can keep employees and kiddos in a constant threat response. Other examples of a threat response under autonomy are, like I said, the loss of choice or having a choice being made for you losing a limb or losing your mobility, layoffs, um, and any type of negative consequences. Um, things that can move you toward a reward under the autonomy is self-indulgence can do that sometimes. Um, so think about the times that you self-indulge. Uh, sometimes it can be on the unhealthy side of things and we can use that as a reward, um, almost like a comfort eating type reward. Sometimes we self-indulge with cake and you know candies and desserts. Um, exercising control um, in the world of autonomy and making a choice and sticking to that choice without going, oh gosh, what else did I miss out on? What other choices can I make? Picking one and sticking to it and exercising that level of control can increase your autonomy as well and move you further toward that reward. So the next one is R, relatedness. Relatedness is a sense of safety with others. And when we meet new people, the brain automatically and autonomically perceives that person as a threat because it's wired to perceive anybody that we haven't connected with yet as a threat. Connecting with or being introduced to just one or two people in a new setting can quite dramatically decrease the threat response that's happening in the brain. Simple bonding, as in having a conversation, a nice firm handshake that's not too limp or too strong, sharing a story, all of these things can generate an oxytocin response. And oxytocin creates a, creates a bonding response in the brain that sends a message that means like us instead of not like us, or the perception of friend versus foe. So friendly gestures, fostering, socializing, and mentoring programs can all lead to a reward response while fostering competition 
and prohibiting socializing, especially um, no fraternizing in the workplace or how socializing can sometimes limited be limited in school settings, for example, can lead to an increased threat response. So ostracizing somebody, isolating them or excluding them increases the threat under the relatedness category, whereas inclusion, things like promotion, being invited or included in something, and um, a chance to belong are all what move us into that reward response under the relatedness category. And finally, the last category that our brains are always looking for triggers or threats in the environment is fairness. And fairness is a sense of what is impartial and just. And it's a non-biased exchange between people. So it's about a fair exchange. And that looks like making transparent decisions, open communication, candidness, and communicating clear rules and guidelines. An unfair or unjust exchange looks like unequal treatment, unclear rules, and a lack of clear communication, all of which will put the brain into a threat response. Um, other threats under fairness can look like unfair pay, being lied to, unmet expectations. So if you're going to set an expectation and a clear set of guidelines, stick to them, because if you don't stick to them and they're not met, that's immediately gonna send somebody into a threat. So, um, to move people more toward that reward response under fairness, that would look like receiving just pay or equal pay at work, um, expectations actually being met and lived up to. And another really good example of how to foster fairness in relationships is receiving an apology from somebody who wronged you or you can create that reward response whenever you realize you've wronged somebody else be the one to apologize. So I hope this gives you a better understanding of triggers and how our brain is always scanning for those triggers or those threats. And I didn't get into the physiology of the brain and what's actually happening, but there's a lot happening in the brain when the brain perceives a threat versus perceives a reward. It's a whole different set of chemistry that's happening, different hormones, different neurology, and it can happen in a nanosecond. So I hope this helps give you a little bit better understanding of your triggers so you can understand yourself, your own behaviors, your reactiveness and your responsiveness, and the behaviors, the reactiveness and the responsiveness of those around you just a little bit better. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. You can find a link to my website below and if you found this information helpful, please subscribe. And if you think somebody else might find this valuable, please send this and share this video with them because I'm here to help. And if there are any questions or that I can answer, please reach out to me. I can't wait to hear from you. Have a great day, everyone, and happy self-discovery.